good evening friends and good evening friends uh, amongst us we have mr vishwanath angdi and the interesting facet is that despite the fact that he is in us and it's 7 am he has readily agreed to share his knowledge on the arms act how the understandability how its legal journey he has taken a lot of sessions with us and it's always pleasure connecting with him and we are so happy that even at 7 am he is ready to share his knowledge and that to for a weekend in our place in chandigarh and all over india so without taking much time uh, we request sir to share his knowledge over to you on behalf of beyond law clc and to vikram and associates thank you mr vikas good evening to all the viewers the topic is very interesting arms act and arms rules the arms act is amended in 2019 under which uh, many changes were made to the arms act we got now the new set of arms rules of uh, 2016 which repealed the earlier rules many of uh, the officers of the courts even the public in general those who own arms and ammunition are not aware of the recent amendments to the arms act and the impact of the arms rules at first i will dwell with regard to the important amendments brought to the arms act by act of 2019 which came into force from 13 12 2019 basically arms act is amended with regard to the context of section 2 of the act which deals with definitions clause then also sections 3 5 6 8 15 25 27 and 44 of the arms act of 1959 and we got the new arms rules of 2016 which repealed the earlier arms rules and as per the amendment act of 2019 a person can hold only two firearms in place of three firearms as per the old act so the first important aspect of amendment is now an individual can hold in all two firearms in place of three firearms that also includes any weapon which that person may have got as a legal heir or by means of inheritance or by means of what is called as heir loan so maximum is two earlier it was three and uh, those who are holding more than two weapons were directed by the amendment act to deposit the same with the government within one year from 13/12/2019 that is by the end of 2020 they were required to deposit so beyond the date 13/12 2020 holding of any weapon beyond 2 is said to be illegal so that is uh, the first important aspect of uh, amendment to the arms act so in place of uh, three firearms now it is two firearms and uh, the date to deposit the remaining extra one weapon was 13122020 one more important uh, amendment is uh, if any person takes away arms and ammunition from the police or from a police station or from a police officer or armed forces then in that case the penalty for imprisonment the penalty for this offence is now in the range of 10 years and uh, sentence to life taking away arms and ammunition from the police or from police station or from armed forces 
is now made a separate aspect of sub offense and the punishment is in the range of minimum of 10 years and up to life sentence the next important point is the act also punishes reckless use of weapons such as celebratory gun fires during weddings or marriages or ceremonies as per the practice of a given religion that threaten human life or personal safety of others so for the use of weapons as celebratory gun fires during weddings etc so the penalty is up to 2 years or with a fine of 2 rupees 1 lakh or both the new act has defined the words organized crime organized crime syndicate and also illegal trafficking in arms and ammunition the new act as per the amendment to 25 of the arms act provides that it is illegal to trade or acquire or sell firearms firearms and ammunition to and from india where the firearms are not marked and the acquis contra provisions of the arms act the punishment is up to 10 years no uh, from uh, from 10 years up to life as the case may be the new act defines the words organized crime as a member of a crime doing continued unlawful activity either himself or the member of the organized crime by using unlawful means such as violence or coercion to gain economic or other benefit as you all know carrying on of an illegal act by group of persons is said to be doing the act with intent and here separately 251a provides for punishment for carrying on organized crime by the accused carrying arms and ammunition then the phrase organized crime syndicate is defined as consisting of two or more persons committing an organized crime one more departure is that by way of amendment 2 the act wherein special status is given to sports person as per the new rules international medalist renowned shooters are allowed to keep additional weapons up to 12 under the exempted category which earlier was 7 besides two weapons which they can possess as an indian national if a shooter is renowned in one event then he can keep maximum of 8 in place of earlier 4 that is as per the amended provisions of the rules a junior target shooter or aspiring shooter now can possess two weapons in place of one so these important provisions are enacted by means of amendment to give an impetus to the sports persons who want to take up this important aspect of the sport under rule 40 of the arms rules of 2016 the shooters are empowered to possess two firearms as normal citizens of india besides those exempted category of weapons which they can hold and they also can purchase more number of uh, ammunition if they are shooters for their practice in a given year as per the new act no permit 
or license is required for a citizen for acquisition or to possess small arms falling under the category of curio c u r i i o curio so these are the important changes brought to the arms act and we have got now the amended provisions of arms act and also new sets of uh, arms rules with this uh, brief uh, prelude i'll start now quickly the important aspect of uh, definitions of important words which are used in the arms act as we all know every special act is enacted by the parliament to cater to a particular special need and we have to keep in mind what are the special features of a special enactment and in this arms act we got uh, section 8 of uh, the arms act which deals with uh, what is called as a type of presumption which in law we call it as shall presume we got presumptions which are three number may presume shall presume and conclusive proof under the indian, in, under the indian evidence act so the eight of the act is with uh, shall presume what the court shall presume in case of uh, violation of uh, provisions of uh, eight of the act is uh, to be seen by us in uh, due course of time and for some special enactments they provide that uh, unless there is a sanction to prosecute the accused given by a prescribed authority the case cannot go further or that the accused may plead for his uh, acquittal so we got here also a case of a provision of the arms act which provides that uh, for prosecution of the offense by the accused there must be obtaining of the prior sanction of uh, the concerned official of uh, the department as per the act so with this uh, we will now start uh, quickly with regard to important definitions of uh, the arms act that is two of the act section 2 sub clause 1 sub clause a of the act uh, defines uh, the word acquisition as also including hiring borrowing or accepting as gift so if i accept by of gift an arm or ammunition that is said to be what is called as acquisition under 21a of the act so an accused cannot plead in the court that uh, if the arm or ammunition was gifted to him by somebody else because the word gift or acceptance by of gift is now within the meaning of the word acquisition as if he has acquired as if he has bought so the word gift or accepting by of gift is within the word what's called as acquisition so acquisition means as inclusive of hiring borrowing or accepting as gift so my point is we cannot import general legal knowledge when we deal with a special enactment and 21a of the act speaks of the word acquisition 2b of the act speaks of the word ammunition as including ammunition for any firearm and we got seven types of ammunitions under 21b of the act the example source rockets bombs grenades shells missiles or article designed for torpedo service and submarine mining so we got there seven important types of uh, ammunition under 21b of the act i will not take uh, much time to discuss all those things 21c defines the word arm arms what is called as arms arms is uh, an article of any description designed or adapted as weapon for offenses 
or weapon for defenses. So an arm may serve two purposes, weapon for offense, number two, weapon to commit, uh, weapon for defense. So for self-defense, the arm can be used or the same arm can be used for the purpose of what is called as commission of a crime. So a knife at home can be used for the purpose of cutting an apple or also for causing injury to any person. So that is the aspect of the word arm under 21c of the act. The act says that uh, arm is what you call weapon for defense or weapon for offense as the case may be but not including articles for domestic or agricultural purposes. A knife used at home is not called as an arm under 21c of the act. So also things, articles for purpose of agriculture. So a lati or an ordinary walking stick are not arms under 21c of the act. The Supreme Court of India in Neil versus State of West Bengal 1972 SCC criminal page number 64 held that the word sword is an arm under 21c of the arms act. One more point is High Court of Delhi in Nanak Chand versus State of Delhi, that is 1992, Criminal Law Journal, Delhi, page number 55, held that Kirpan is not a knife. One more case law of the Abbas Court is that the Supreme Court of India in Surinder versus State of Haryana. 1994, Part 4, SCC, page 365, held that uh, in of Section 2, Subclass 1, Subclass B of the Act, in the context of the word ammunition, the court held that uh, a cartridge can be an ammunition for any firearm if it is a live cartridge if it is a live cartridge. So the prosecution in a case before the court is required to prove that the cartridge which was found in the person of the accused without the license was a live cartridge and that the weapon, the ammunition, the what you call firearm in question was in a working condition when the same was seized by the prosecution for the offence of possessing arms and ammunition without license or permit. So these case laws of the Apex Court indicate the scope of the word arm, the word ammunition under 21B and 21C of the Act. 2 subclass 1 subclass E speaks of the word firearms and that uh, I mean, I mean, you can just go through. We have got uh, uh, various types of uh, firearms uh, under the Arms Act, which are four in number. I will not take much time. Two subclass one subclass E A is uh, what is called as license. Now, formerly the licenses were issued in physical form, that is, uh, in the form of a booklet. Now that we can also have what is called as uh, electronic. Uh, a mode of uh, license uh, that is called as uh, um, electronic form of holding of the license. Section 2, subclass 1, FF of uh, the Act is very important. Meaning of the word magistrate in the context of Arms Act means only what is called as magistrate on section 20 of the CRPC. 20 of CRPC states that uh, executive magistrate is what is called as magistrate for the purpose of CRPC and the same meaning is imported 
in the arms act under 21 ff of the act so the word magistrate occurring in the arms act must not be confused with the words which we use in court namely magistrate of the regular court regular court of uh, under the hierarchy of the high courts but it is a magistrate under the aspect of the revenue subdivision of a government so magistrate means what's called as executive magistrate under 20 of the crpc so in 21b 21h speaks of what is called as prohibited arms and with that the next important point is 21k of the act what is called as a transfer under the arms act transfer under the arms act may be of four types letting on hire lending giving and parting with the custody of the arms and ammunition so transfer as per the arms act also includes what is called as giving and parting with the portion of the arms and ammunition so don't keep in mind what the word transfer means in common legal parlance here transfer means either letting on hire lending giving parting with portion of a given arm or ammunition so this will take now quickly the important aspects of uh, sections uh, 3 to 12 which are uh, what is called what is called as the sections with which we should be familiar and uh, section 3 speaks of uh, what's called as license to acquire and possess uh, firearms and ammunition so chapter 2 sections uh, 3 to 12 deals with the heading acquisition possession manufacture sale import and export of arms and ammunition that provides that we should have separate permit to acquire to possess to manufacture for sale also by a vendor for importer for import and for exporter to export of any arms and ammunition so there is a separate set of uh, issuance of uh, licenses to cater to separate sets of needs of the concerned applicant for rent of license three speaks of license for acquisition and possession of firearms and ammunition so even to acquire firearms and ammunition and even to possess firearms and ammunition the law says you must have license X is owner of an arm. He is licensed. He is leaving India to USA for three months. He wants to give it to his, to his friend. So the friend to possess that arms and ammunition for three months must apply to the consent department and obtain permission. So license for acquisition to acquire or even to possess any firearm and ammunition is required under three of the act so no person shall acquire or have in his position or carry any firearm or ammunition unless he holds a license in this behalf so this is uh, the tenor of uh, three of the act so with that uh, any person holding any weapon beyond two beyond 13 12 2019 as per section 3 sub plus 2 is required to deposit the extra weapon extra firearm with the nearest police station or with the consent named authorities under 3 2 of the act within a period of one year that is within 13 12 2020 the extra weapon or firearm must be deposited by the concerned person so with that uh, section 3 sub 3 of the act states that uh, this providence uh, 
have no application to a dealer in firearms or any member of a rifle club or rifle association. So for section 3 of the act, the punishment is on section 25 1A of the Arms Act. So 3 of the act is important. 25 1A is the penal clause and uh, uh, for prosecuting the accused under 3 of the act punishment is 25 1A of the act what the act provides that is that there must be previous sanction of the district magistrate to prosecute the accused under 3 of the act so for 3 of the act violation only that requires previous sanction of the deputy commissioner or the district magistrate of the district to prosecute the accused. So, three of the act contravention, punishment is 251A, and three of the act says that uh, there must be prior sanction to prosecute given by the deputy commissioner or by the district magistrate under section. 39 of the act so section 3 25 1a and 39 of the act they go together and they go hand in hand the appeals court has held in many cases that any charge sheet filed by the prosecution on three of the arms act without prior sanction of the deputy commissioner is wide is not as per law and that the acquittal is entitled for acquittal on the aspect of uh, non-obtaining of uh, previous sanction from the deputy commissioner of a given district. So, four speaks of uh, license to acquire and possess uh, arms of uh, specified uh, categories. Five speaks of uh, license for manufacture, obtaining, procuring, or for sale, transfer, conversion repair or testing or proving etc of arms and ammunition so fight this with uh, the aspect of license to be taken for manufacture obtaining procuring or for sale of uh, the arms and ammunition so even for repairing also that requires uh, permission repairing testing proving conversion of uh, a weapon into some other type for all these things that requires permission so under the new amendment act of uh, 2019 the words added are even for a manufacture of uh, arms and ammunition that requires uh, permit even for obtaining of arms and ammunition that requires permission so also to procure for procurement of arms and ammunition also that requires permission so the words manufacturing obtaining and procuring these three are added in five of the act by amendment act of 2019 so five is of a greater magnitude that covers need of license for manufacturing obtaining procuring for purpose of sale or for transfer conversion repairs or testing or proving of arms and ammunition so with this uh, the next point is uh, six of uh, the act uh, license for shortening of uh, barrel of uh, firearm or conversion of uh, imitation firearm into firearm so to shorten the length of uh, barrel of uh, a firearm that requires permission or for conversion of imitation firearm into a regular firearm for use as a firearm that requires a permit that is a license son of act is a prohibition of acquisition of possession or of manufacture or sale of prohibited arms or ammunition so there cannot be illegal selling of prohibited weapons so son of the act the offense court in the case of Arvind Kumar Sharma versus Union of India 
that is uh, 2016 part 15 SCC 115 in the context of uh, APIL filed by an advocate practicing in the Supreme Court of India. The advocate alleged in the PL to the fact that uh, there is uh, illegal selling of prohibited or NSP bore weapons obtained by army personnel through Central Ordnance Depot, short form is COD, Jabalpur, on the basis of order passed by the allotment committee. His further complaint was that the said weapons were sold by army personnel to the public in general and that public having criminal background including anti-social elements and terrorist in breach of arms rules and powers of arms, arms act were acquiring the same. The Supreme Court of India in this case stepped in that the said order of the allotment committee is bad in law and that it has got a greater impact on the society. So for details you can go through the decision 2016 part 15 SCC 115 Arvind Kumar Sharma versus Union of India. One more point is that can there be absolute prohibition by the government to possess what is called as a prohibited or or not? That's the question. Because Section 7 speaks of prohibition of acquisition of possession of or manufacture or sale of prohibited arms or prohibited ammunition. So whether Section of the Act says that there is a absolute bar of prohibition of having what's called as a prohibited arm or prohibited ammunition. In this context, the High Court of Allahabad in Ganesh Chandra Bhatt versus DM Almora, that is 1993, part 21, Allahabad Law Reporter, page 300, in the context of section 13 of the Act also held that the authority consent must consider all the relevant facts and circumstances and must not act arbitrarily in disposing of application filed by the applicant for grant of license to possess what is called as prohibited arms or prohibited ammunition. So if as per law the applicant meets all the requirements under the provisions of 7 and 13, uh, 13 of the Act, then the High Court held that the authority cannot refuse to grant license under 13 of the Act permitting the licensee to hold prohibited arms or prohibited ammunition. Then it is very important, prohibition of sale, prohibition of sale or transfer of firearms not bearing marks of identification. This is amended in 2019. So under aid of the Act, no person or no vendor, uh, no person shall obliterate, remove, alter or force any name, number or mark of identification stamped or otherwise shown on a firearm or ammunition. Every firearm or ammunition has uh, marked on it uh, what is called as uh, the name of uh, the manufacturer and all those particulars. So 8.1 says that uh, no person shall obliterate, remove, alter or forge any name, number or other mark of identification stamped or otherwise shown on a firearm or ammunition. 
एंड एट टू सेस नो पर्सन शाल सेल सो नो वेंडर शाल सेल और ट्रांसफर एनी फायर आम विच डज नॉट बेयर दबोस एट मार्क्स सो ए वेंडर ऑफ आर्म्स एंड एमिनेशन शाल सेल ओनली दोज आर्म्स एंड एमिनेशन विच कंटेन और विच हैव ऑन इट और ऑन देम वट इज कॉल्ड एज द नेम नंबर एंड अदर मार्क्स ऑफ आइडेंटिफिकेशन एट थ्री इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट हियर वी कम अक्रॉस वॉट कॉल्ड एज वॉट द कोर्ट शाल प्रिज्यूम सो एट थ्री इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एट थ्री सेज वेन एवर एनी पर्सन हैज इन हिज पोजिशन एनी फायर आम विदाउट सच नेम ऑफ द मैनुफैक्चरर और सीरियल नंबर और मार्क ऑफ आइडेंटिफिकेशन एज अ केस मे बी देन इट्स आर प्रिज्यूम्ड बाय द कोर्ट अनलेस द कॉन्ट्रेर इज प्रूव दैट इट इज द सेट पर्सन हुई हैज इन हिज पोजिशन एनी फायर आम दैट ही हैज ऑब्लिटरेटेड रिमूव altered or forged that name number or mark of identification so a3 says that if i possess a firearm which does not contain the name of the manufacturer or if there is erasure of name of the manufacturer or there is tampering with mark of identification of either the serial number name of manufacturer etc the courts are presumed until the contrary is proved by the accused that the so called accused only obliterated removed altered or forged the same so 83b is 83 is very very important under the general criminal law for proof of ipc violations or ipc offences the the law states that the standard of proof for ipc offences is proof beyond all reasonable doubt the prosecution shall prove its case beyond all reasonable doubt in the context of charge filed by the police under section under presence of the ipc and its violations under arms act in the context of 8 of the act prohibition of sale or transfer of firearms not bearing identification marks is amended in 2019 so that this 8 of the act 83 of the act this particular strict proof of the case proof beyond all reasonable doubt is diluted in as much as in this case of 83 of the act the accused shall dislodge as to how the weapon namely firearm and its position came to be tampered with so 83 is, is diluted under this aspect of amendment and the strict proof that is proof beyond all reasonable doubt as in the case of apc is rather made dilute under 8 of the arms act with this we will take into account line of the act that is prohibition of acquisition or possession or for sale or transfer to a young person and other types of persons named in section 9 of the act so then of the act states that uh, there cannot be a blanket sale by a vendor in arms and ammunition and that uh, the word young person is defined in line of the act so there can be no acquisition or possession of uh, certain types of uh, firearms to young person who is uh, defined as a person less than 21 years then 10 of the act speaks of uh, license for import or export of arms and ammunition by sea land or uh, air etc 
11 speaks of uh, power to prohibit uh, import or export of firearm by the central government. Uh, so, and 12 speaks of uh, the aspect of uh, power of government to regulate uh, the use of uh, airspace for transport over India or any part of India, any type of uh, arms and ammunition. So with this, uh, we have completed the aspect of uh, sections uh, 3 to 12 of uh, the Act and uh, with that uh, sections uh, 13 to 18 it speaks of uh, aspect of uh, the application for grant of license by applicant for issuance of uh, a given type of permit or permission and uh, as per the amendment provisions of uh, the act the permit issued now is uh, for a period of uh, five years in place of uh, earlier period of uh, three years under 15 of uh, the arms act amended uh, four years ago the license will be issued now for a period of five years in place of uh, three years with effect from 13 uh, 13 12 9, uh, 13 12 2019 so now license issued will be for a period of uh, five years in place of the earlier tenure of three years. The question is what is legal effect of section 15 sub so 3 of the Act? Whether application for renewal of a license filed by an applicant is to be treated as a case of application for grant of a fresh license or not was the question which was before the High Court of Bombay in a given case. So High Court of Bombay in Mohan Lal, Chandu Lal, Sarai versus State of Maharashtra, 1993 Maharashtra Law Journal, page 365 held that the legal effect of section 15, suppose 3 of the Arms Act is that uh, the renewal application of the applicant is to be considered as an application for a grant of a fresh license. One more case on the point is uh, the Supreme Court of India in Ram Kripal Singh versus uh, State of UP 1987 Allahabad Law Journal page 1209 held that uh, renewal of license cannot be refused upon the mere ground of delay in applying for it. So these case laws indicate that the authority and power to renew license should keep in mind the important facts of the concerned case and you must keep in mind the aspect of uh, presence of the act and there shall not be disallowing the claim of uh, the applicant for renewal or rent of license on uh, ulterior what you call motives the question is can there be cancellation of uh, license issued by the department to a person to possess arms and ammunition without hearing him. So, order of cancellation of uh, armed license under 15.3 of the Act is to be passed only after giving to the licensee an opportunity of being heard. There cannot be so more to a cancellation of license issued by the department, but there should be cancellation of the license only after hearing the licensee that is the ratio of uh, high court of uh, Punjab and Haryana in uh, Daoba Arms Company versus uh, State of uh, Punjab 1992 part 1 crimes page number 718 so with that the most important aspects of uh, the 
matter I will just highlight the question is use of firearms for self-defense cannot be said to be misused and cannot be said to be misuse of firearm so the high court of Allahabad in Sangat Singh versus Commissioner Kumaun Division 1991 ACC page number 666 held that use of firearms for self-defense cannot be said to be misuse of firearms so with that we will take into account nextly that is who can demand production of arms and ammunition so under 19 of the act only some persons are empowered to demand production of license for carrying arms or ammunition that is number one is by any officer of the police station so any police officer can demand or any other officer especially empowered in the behalf so officer of the police department or other officer specially empowered under the act they have got the power to demand production of license by a person or to carry ammunition or arms that is 19 of the act 20 of that speaks with arrest of persons conveying arms or ammunition under suspicious cases who can arrest persons conveying arms and ammunition under suspicious circumstances that is by a magistrate magistrate means executive magistrate under 20 of the crpc number two any police officer number three any other public servant under 21 of the ipc any person employed or working upon a railway aircraft vessel vehicle or any other means of conveyance and they can arrest without warrant and seize such arms and ammunition so persons empowered to arrest a person carrying on arms and ammunition under suspicious cases are what's called as five-fold number a magistrate executive magistrate police officer any other public servant officers persons employed in railway aircraft vessel vehicle or any other means of conveyance so with this the initial important aspect is namely power of search under provisions of 22 of the arms act search of the house or premises and seizure by a magistrate of arms and ammunition so every search under the arms act should be by or in the presence of a magistrate so the important point is search of house of the premises of the accused and seizure of the same shall be by or in the presence of a magistrate or by or in the presence of some other officer especially empowered in this regard by the central government so search and search of house or premises and seizure should be by a magistrate of the arms and ammunition so by a magistrate or in his presence or in the presence of magistrate or other person empowered by the central government in the above regard so this is very very important so 22 search of the house or premises and seizure of arms and ammunition by a magistrate or by specially empowered officer 23 speaks of search of vessels vehicles etc by any police officer or by specially empowered officer or by executive magistrate so with this uh, we'll take into account nextly the offenses under the act that is uh, 25 to 33 of the act 
this is uh, the aspect of the last leg of uh, the present uh, discussion 25 speaks of uh, punishment for some offenses so 25 is amended in uh, 2019 and in this uh, amendment of uh, 2019 various important uh, things uh, are uh, brought in force 251b is added as per the proposed amendment so if any person by force takes any firearm from the police or from armed forces then here the punishment shall not be less than 10 years and may extend up to life sentence and both any person unlawfully taking away firearm from the police or from armed forces now here the punishment is on a very higher scale not less than 10 years and up to life sentence so this is added to the arms act by amendment by adding section 25 1a b in 2019 so some amendments are but in force in 25 of uh, the act and so also it speaks of uh, commission of offense by a member of uh, organized crime syndicate so I, I discussed in the beginning what's called as uh, organized crime syndicate member of organized crime all those things so with this uh, uh, 25 of the act is uh, uh, completed then uh, the question is whether the police officers under the Delhi Special Police Establishment have the power to investigate for the offenses and violence of the arms are arms that are not in the question. So that is called as extension of power of Delhi Special Police Establishment. So the Delhi police, uh, Delhi special police establishment are empowered under various uh, government orders uh, issued by various uh, governments, state governments, uh, to uh, wherein they are empowered to investigate uh, for the offenses uh, on sections uh, 25 to 30 of the Arms Act. So, as regards uh, the state of Karnataka because I worked in state of Karnataka quite uh, some time and here for state of Karnataka as per notification dated 4-11-1986 uh, the powers and jurisdiction of uh, members of uh, Delhi special police establishment get conferred and that uh, the IOs of uh, Delhi Special Police Establishment are empowered to investigate and accused on sections 25 to 30 of the Arms Act and also section 5 of In Explosives Act of 1884. The question is when the court can convict the accused under 25 of the Arms Act, what things must the court keep in mind the on this point we got the case law of the apex court in gunavantalal gunavantalal was a state of mp 1972 part 2 scc page 194 in this case the apex court held that uh, the first precondition to track the 251a is the element of intention conscious or knowledge with which a person possessed the firearm before it can be said to constitute an offense number two is that he must have what's called as the intent to commit the offense so as per the abortion of the Supreme Court of India the important point is intention 
conscious or knowledge with regard to the weapons in question and he having control over the gun even though the person who uses the gun may use the gun at the instance of the accused person so that is the ratio of the case of the appeals court in Gurwant Lal versus state of MP the important point is that mere fact of possession of gun and cartridges from the accused without proving that the gun was in a working condition and that the seized cartridges were live the appeals court in the case of jaspal singh versus state of punjab 1998 part 7 scc 289 held that the conviction of the accused is bad in law so the appeals court in the case of the passing held that the prosecution should prove that the seized gun was in a working condition and that the seized cartridges were also live cartridges and without proof of those two important aspects the appeals court held that the conviction of the accused under 25th arms act is not proper so i will not uh, multiply the cases on 25th act i have just given you a bird's eye view of uh, what is uh, the aspect of uh, ratio of uh, the decisions of the supreme court of india on the given aspect of uh, the provisions of uh, the arms act so with this the next, the next important point is uh, absence of uh, any expert opinion about uh, the status of uh, recovered cartridges does not affect the conviction under five of the act for being found unauthorizedly in possession of a revolver in the no- notified area This is the case of Appeals Court in Anil v. State of Maharashtra, 1996, Part 2, SCC, page number 589. Whether a son can make use of a gun of the father who has a licensee in the exercise of a right to to defend person of the father whether it requires permission is a question which was before the apex court in the case of bhagavan swarup versus state of mp 1992 part 2 scc member 406 in this case the apex court held that using a gun of father in exercise of uh, right to defend person of the father cannot be considered as possessing an arm without a license so son using the weapon of his father who is licensee for the purpose of uh, defending his father in an attack by some person the appeals court held that uh, that requires no permit or license for the son to use the weapon of the father for the right to defend his father in case of requirement so with this the next important point is namely 35 of the act criminal responsibility of person in occupation of premises so in some cases the owner of premises who has given the premises on lease to a tenant if is aware of the tenant using the premises for purpose of storing or for purpose of carrying on the illegal activity of 
dealing in arms and ammunition, the law states that uh, that owner shall inform the police of uh, use of the premises of his ownership by the tenant for carrying on the illegal activity. So that is called as criminal responsibility of person in occupation of premises and liability of the owner of premises to intimate if he is aware of existence of arms and ammunition in his premises. With this, 39 is a previous sanction of the district magistrate to the prosecutor accused under section 3 of the act violation are told in the beginning. So for violation of 3 of the act, the act says that to prosecute the accused, there shall be prior sanction of the deputy commissioner, failing which the accused is required to be admitted. And that is the ratio in the case of uh, Mohinder Singh versus uh, State of uh, Haryana, 1996, Part 11, SCC 369. Absence of previous sanction under 39 of the Act for prosecution of the accused under 3 of the Act and consequent conviction under Section 26 of the Arms Act, Red Bridge Section 6 of TADA was held by Apex Court as illegal in this case of uh, Mohinder Singh versus State of Haryana. So with that, the last section is uh, 45 of the Act. Act not to apply in some cases. There are two cases in which this Act has no application. But one is uh, arms or ammunition on board any seagoing vessel or any aircraft and forming part of ordinary armament or equipment of such vessel or aircraft, namely as an original equipment of the vessel or ship or aircraft that requires no prior permission. If a ship is sold by a ship builder to a ship buyer, which is fitted with the arms or ammunition as part of ordinary fitment of the ship or if an aircraft is sold by an aircraft manufacturing company to a purchaser which is fitted with ordinary armament or equipment of the aircraft then for those fitted what do you call arms and ammunition in the particular aircraft or vessel as part of the vehicle being sold as an original equipment, the Act says that uh, persons of arms act uh, have no obligation. So also, any public servant on duty possessing arms and ammunition, namely a PSI or a CPI, etc., so they are empowered to possess it because of their duty, that requires no permission. So also, a person possessing arms and ammunition under order of central government personal permission. So also members of National Cadet Corps NCC Act of 1948. So these four types of persons, these two in these four cases, the Act says that uh, there is no need to apply for permission under 45 of the Act. So with this arms rules came into force on 15th of July 2016. So I got now the new arms rules and the old arms rules of 1962 is repealed in its entirety. So rule 2 of the arms rules defines various words. So section 2 sub plus 3 of the arms rules speaks of what is called as antique small arm as meaning firearms manufactured before 1899. So they define what is called as antique small arm. Then they also defined here section 2 sub plus 17 meaning of curio. Curio means a small arm manufactured at least 50 years prior to the current date. So any arm, small arm manufactured prior to say 1972 
are certified by the curator of a government regulated museum or that devices at least half of its monetary value or that derives the, at least half of its monetary value or the fact it is novel, rare, bizarre or associated with or historical figure etc. So with this uh, the other aspects of uh, the rules uh, I mean they are uh, mainly concerned with the aspect of uh, use by the regulating department and uh, rule 103 speaks of uh, confiscation capture or seizure of firearms and ammunition by the firearm bureaus 104 speaks of uh, destruction of firearms and ammunition so with this uh, we'll, take, we'll take into account a, a few case laws on the aspect of arms sector that is uh, Istikar versus uh, State of UP 2012 Part 12 SCC page number 307 Section 7 Supplies A of uh, JJ Act of 2000 302 of the IPC and 25 of the Arms Act. In this case, the Appeals Court held that uh, the court must pass order on the application filed by an offender on the point of uh, his uh, juvenility. In this case, one of the accused before the court uh, filed application saying that uh, I was less than 18 years when the offense uh, was allegedly committed. And he filed application asking the court to give a finding at first on the application to declare him as to whether he is an accused above 18 years or whether he is uh, less than 18 years. In this case, the Abbas court held that the court must give first finding on the application filed by the offender on the point of his uh, juvenility and then proceed further if it holds that uh, the so-called offender is uh, above 18 years. So with this, I have completed the aspect of uh, the Arms Act and Arms Rules and I have focused mainly on the aspect of uh, recent amendments to the Arms Act and uh, the principles of law as per the arms rules of uh, 2016 if the viewers have got any doubt on the aspect of uh, the arms act because it is a specialized act and uh, we cannot complete it within one year, one hour i have taken uh, you with uh, the important facets of the arms act especially the amendment provisions and also what the court have stated in the context of uh, uh, proof of offenses and the presence of the arms act if any doubts are there you may kindly Yes, sir. We have to become yes. with us. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. It was a very scholarly presentation, sir. Especially fact, this uh, this uh, piece of enactment. You have thrown a lot of lights, sir, on uh, the recent amendments. Because for me also, I teach regularly in our High Court Academy for officers and uh, my endeavor was here to state about the case laws of the Apex Court and especially keeping in mind the amendments. In fact, I told Mr. Vikas that we will frame the wordings of the today's subject as amendments to the Arms Act and new arms rules and he told that uh, no, no, let it be arms act only. You can cover everything, whatever you want it. So I have done my two jobs, telling to the audience all the important features of the arms act, plus amendments. 
yeah. and my request is don't just uh, go through the cases involving arms act as a regular criminal case because burden of proof in case of ipc violations is strict beyond all reasonable doubt here for eight of the act contravention that is diluted sometimes uh, we may miss the said aspect and a case of uh, what you call uh, acquittal will be convicted under eight of the act because accused must step in the witness box and state as to how in what manner the weapon which he purchased its uh, serial number or mark of distinction etc came to be erased or came to be changed as the case may be right that uh, director was slightly joined late i was telling sir is in us and right now it was when we started the session it was 6 7 am so i said that his passion to take things forward uh, so kind of sir to log in early morning i think uh, it should be 6 o'clock when sir started the session early morning 6 yeah, am yeah. yeah it was uh, uh, 7:30 7:30. So, where about the limiting the number of arms possession has any effect from three to two arms? Now, because the, the government of uh, India thought that uh, there is a holding of large number of arms, and many arms are possessed by many persons uh, without license. At least by lessening the number three to two, so one extra arm by a person who is licensed to possess. that is given back to the government lord with the government so and uh, there to be also a huge number i don't know the exact uh, statistics one arm extra in place of uh, 3 now it is 2 uh, on an all india basis it will also mean a very huge number and what the government thought that uh, one is enough for self defense you can have two that's all but only more than 2 is not permissible and not required also and by keeping in house or in the armory more number of weapons than required for use that leads to lending it unofficially and there may be use of those weapons though licensed by somebody else so uh, to do away with further times they just uh, made it from 3 to 2 and one more point is there is the law scale use of these arms and ammunition form now formerly in the state of jammu and kashmir there they had given a special status you can own it you can have it because for the self defense but now from 13 12 it is amended and i think a uh, very uh, large number of people that deposited extra arm the third arm firearm with the department if the possess now also they have to deposit back to the government so with an application for uh, condoning of the delay in reporting or in lodging the third web, third or uh, third firearm and government will accept it and condone the delay also now anybody possessing three firearms now is said to commit offense for holding one extra firearm with their license previously and now that it is kept in what's called as d Lesson question. Yeah. Can you say something about uh, Sanjay Dutt's case, sir? If we could uh, recollect, because he was convicted under the Arms Act. Yeah, that is Tata Act. Yeah. Tata. Oh, uh, but it, there is uh, uh, implications of uh, the Tata Act and also Arms Act. Both are being put together. Uh, there also the Appeals Court held that uh, there is a conscious portion of the arms, conscious portion of arms. Uh, for the purpose of uh, what you call commission of uh, terrorist act under the tad act and that uh, the supreme court scaled down the punishment to a lower level compared to the punishment awarded by the tada court at mumbai and even now we have got uh, a case wherein uh, what is the role of uh, private security personnel employed by some persons they use the fire they use the arms because they are empowered to uh, possess arms and ammunition they use it they in the in the case of encounter or safety of the concerned person for whom they are there they shoot what is legal effect of that particular uh, what you call murder 
of persons by this private security personnel. This question was there before the Supreme Court of India. And the Supreme Court of India uh, thought fit that uh, on this branch of law, there is no case law. So, private security personnel employed by various persons, employed by various agencies, if they resort to use of arms and ammunition and they cause death. See, police officer in encounter is empowered to even uh, shoot at the accused if he's trying to escape. And here also you know that uh, false encounters, the first court has told, took place in a given case. But here, in case of the uh, police personnel, I mean, uh, private security personnel, they make use of this arms and ammunition. There we got uh, the case law of uh, the Appeals Court. In this case, the Appeals Court held that the uh, government of India must uh, give proper the, the government of India must legislate on this aspect. That is uh, the case of uh, firing incident by private security personnel reported in 2015, part 14, SCC, page number 460. In this case, section 2, subclause F, subclause H of H, section 5, 6, 9, and 10 of Private Security Agencies Regulation Act was involved. And so also use of what is called as arms, sections 3, 4, 13, 14, 17, 27, 30 of Arms Act was also involved. Then these are four of the APC. That is uh, firing incident by private security personnel. 2015 part 14 SCC page number 460. The first court held that uh, on this point of use of this arms, use of uh, arms and ammunition by this uh, private security personnel. There is no law on the point. If they cause death, uh, what is the legal effect? Who can be made liable? Because they work for some agency and in the discharge of the duty, they perform the duty. What about liability of the employer? Say a company employs so and so, the employer the employee does some act. We speak of vicarious liability of the employer for act of the employee. So this case you can just go through. This is a case on the point of uh, firing incident by private security personnel. Regarding the case of uh, Sanjay Dutt, which we just uh, discussed, the case is uh, Sanjay Dutt versus uh, State of uh, Maharashtra, 2013, part 15, SCC, page number 240, 2013, part 15, SCC, page number 240, Sanjay Dutt versus uh, State of Maharashtra, that is section 25, 1A and 1B of Arms Act and also TAD Act. So, thank you sir, on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and Vikram and Associates for sharing your knowledge and also on behalf of all those participants who are watching us live on the YouTube as well as on the Facebook and those who will watch subsequently on the YouTube. Thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you. I thank uh, Mr. Vikas sir, and all the viewers sir, because sir, they made me to read once again, revise here and uh, tell to you what little I knew about the Arms Act and uh, empowerment uh, on any aspect, uh, if it is uh, periodical, that's good for the person who want to empower also. And it's a great opportunity for all of us uh, to discuss and know if there is any uh, new facet of a given enactment or act. I thank once again the viewers and also Sri Vikas and more particularly Mr. Trivikram who is, uh, uh, I mean, he asked the questions which were very live and uh, the important aspect is uh, a person who is well aware, if asked questions, that will be again a foot for thought for the speaker also. And uh, I thank Professor Trivikram because he is uh, 
having in-depth knowledge in this uh, special act. And many of us, many judges also, I mean, don't mistake, I'm not saying, many many of us have just we read, we keep, we keep in mind the IPC. So proof means proof beyond all reasonable doubt. For special enactments, we forget. So my important aspect in every lecture, in the aspect of special enactment is uh, tell it at first what is proof uh, beyond all reasonable doubt, what is called a standard of proof in a special enactment, though it is uh, what's called as uh, uh, penal in nature, and then go forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir.